Hello friends, my guest this week is Murphy Murray. Murphy is a very well respected and well known cannabis extraction expert. She flies all over the country and all over the world to help uh, commercial cannabis growers uh, put in extraction technology. What's really cool about Murphy's story is she's completely self-taught. She came from the business and growing side of the cannabis industry, taught herself uh, tons of chemistry and biotechnology. And now that's her main thing is she's consulting and, and uh, helping train and implement uh, extraction technologies at large scales for, uh, for, can for the cannabis industry. And uh, she's very impressive. And I really enjoy talking with her. She, she, you'll notice in the podcast, she had her son with her. Um, he's going to be quite the social media expert because he wanted to get in on the conversation several times. Uh, but I mean, I can't think of another person more knowledgeable about cannabis. And that's a, a field that I don't know a lot about, but not only does she know a lot about every aspect of that business, but she also knows a lot about the chemistry and underlying science. For, for example, I didn't know really what terpenes were. There's lots of uh, cannabinoids, but just little things like, can you really determine the quality of cannabis just by looking at it? What about those percentages that the dispensers, dispensaries put on the cannabis? Does that actually mean anything? We talked a lot about that. And we also talked about the where the cannabis industry is going in the next five years and how the cannabis growers are today are adapting by looking at the psychedelics market and potentially looking at how they can transition into this new market opportunity that it's emerging. So if you're at all interested in the science and technology side of cannabis and cannabis extraction, this is a real treat. And I'm very thankful for Murray, uh, Murphy's time. And uh, without further ado, Murphy Murray. All right, Murphy, thank you for joining the, the podcast. Uh, very happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Interested to talk uh, with someone uh, who doesn't also live in the cannabis world. <laughs> Interested to see what kind of questions you've got. I know. When I first uh, found out about you, I actually think you followed me from a, a thin layer chromatography video that I did when oh. I was first like getting into learning biotech stuff. And then I started following your updates and I noticed that you were doing, I didn't understand what it was actually, to be honest with you. I saw you with lots of stainless steel equipment and lots of like cool pics of what I guess are purified or extracted cannabinoids, but maybe you could just start with telling everybody what it is that you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do a lot of things, um, but especially... Uh, now in my career, I've been working with Canvas since 2009. Um, so like my entire adult life, basically. And um, I started out on the retail end. I've worked, uh, I've owned gardens and owned dispensaries, but my primary focus now is the extraction world. And that's been my focus since about 2011. I got to that really quickly. Um, and uh, the lab life is a really exciting part of the cannabis industry um, for a couple of different reasons. And I think one of the, the funnest ones is um, that when you compare it to the laboratory environment of almost any other industry, cannabis kind of does everything their own way. <laughs> and so some of that is good and some of that is crazy. Uh, but that's kind of the fun part about science, I think, is that we all get to disagree pretty often. And um, so what I do now is design equipment and optimize equipment for use extracting and purifying cannabis and cannabinoids. And, um, and that takes me all over the country, all over the world. And like the, the job varies every single time that I go in there. You know, when you're doing your thin layer chromatography, you already know what the product is that you're looking for. Um, most of my chromatography is categories of stuff I have no idea how to quantify or identify and cannabinoids. And so most of my job is like chasing those mystery compounds without the tools to actually do it, which is really fun. Um, wow. But it's, it's also kind of hard to describe because it doesn't follow that same pathway that traditional chemistry does to a individual singular identifiable product. Um, almost no cannabis products get anywhere close to 99% purity. 
So, um, so it's, it's chemistry procedures without a chemistry outcome. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. So how did you go from, you said before this, your background was in cannabis, you were in the cannabis industry for a mm -hmm. while. Yeah. You know, and the things you were doing, running dispensaries and gardens, those aren't necessarily, I wouldn't think of as having a lot of overlap with what you do now, other than it's the same industry, but what you're actually doing is completely different. Do you have a, a chemistry background or a biology background? How did you learn this Not stuff? Not at all. Um, I started, I went to school for marketing. That's my, that's my <laughs> academic background. Um, and, uh, and then I got into retail kind of by accident and I was 21. So like, I did a lot of things, uh, you know, I worked in a salon for a couple of months, you know, like that, it was a, um, it was a kind of a transitional job originally. And just the nature of cannabis is so adaptive and a little bit against the grain, you know, it's kind of a rebellious industry in and of itself, which means that if there is a standard procedure or a normal, um, you know, sort of like means of growing through an industry that doesn't apply to us either because it can't or because we resist it. And so there aren't the barriers to entry to get into cannabis that there is to research or, um, you know, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, or any of these other types of, um, you know, chemistry industries. You don't have to be a chemist to go buy an HPLC and try to add up THC, you know, you, uh, it helps, but you know, there's not any of that requirement necessarily. And, um, and a lot of that just comes from, you know, that black market transition. So, um, you know, for the first hundred years of cannabis uh, existing as a monetary uh, trade product in America, it was just the growers, right? And they're communicating directly with the, the consumer essentially, or the person who's selling it to them. And so that was our, our authority on the product. And so all of our research and development about cannabis has largely come from growing cannabis for Israel. <laughs> and that's it, pretty much. You know, like we owe almost everything we know about cannabis to the research teams in Israel. Um, and a lot of that just has to do with the fact that look, they can do whatever they want. They don't have to deal with American laws. So traditional researchers and traditional research methods didn't exist. So we don't have any of that protocol for developing these products. So if you want to sell cannabis, all you have to do is have some cannabis and you can sell it. And if you want to have some cannabis, all you have to do is grow it. So you could just go grow it. And so anybody can get involved really easily. It's very easy to fail. Um, so there's that barrier for entry that you have to have money to waste and product to lose in order to learn those lessons, which is exactly how I learned everything that I know is by repeated failures and good notes. Um, and so uh, I was able to get into it just through the natural progression of the industry, that if I needed hash for my dispensary and I couldn't get it, then I need to go make it. Um, it's, you know, it's a very self-starter type of industry of if you can do it, I can do it. And so uh, a lot of people and a lot of businesses do everything. They, um, it's called vertical integration. And so they'll grow it, they'll process it and they'll sell it. And uh, it's hard to be really good at any one of those things and all of the others, you know, like it, most people are either the social marketing person who's gonna run a dispensary well, or they're like the intuitive plant person that works best alone or the, the lab guy who, you know, lives for cleanliness and procedure. <laughs> and um, so I, I've done a little bit of all of it and it's not where I expected to be, but the lab is where I have had the most fun. And it's also the only part that's been um, challenging in a rewarding way. Like I really love the time that I spend in the lab. It's a lot of fun. So that's really cool. I, I see a lot of overlap between what you do and amateur mushroom growers because mm -hmm. um there's a there's a huge community online of people that are helping each other get started sharing texts and tools and with an emphasis on making things low cost and easy and it sort of sounds like because of your you already were in the industry and around it you had a network to tap into 
and also just had some ancillary experiences. You said you needed hash, so you had to go and figure out how to get it. And mm -hmm. um, that's really, really cool. And so now the, that's like, the, I guess the company, I don't know if it's your company or the company you work for, but that's their only thing right now is they do but consulting for, for companies that want to start doing extraction, cannabis extraction? Yeah, so, um, so it's my uh, consulting. And, um, and so I've got uh, fabricators who can build. And um, I've also got some people that help out with you know, training and um, implementation. But essentially, I take on one client at a time. And we, uh, that's my three right now, so. <laughs> That's fine, totally fine. <laughs> And um, so they they hire me to to solve a specific problem, and uh, more often than not, that problem is that they have too much weed, not enough hash. How do we get from point A to point B um, faster? And so um, a lot of times I'm going in and taking someone who's processing, you know, maybe uh, twenty to fifty pounds a day and trying to get them over two hundred pounds a day. Um, or I'll be going in and talking to someone who is, you know, not hitting the purity and quality goals that they've set out for themselves, and we'll be figuring out where and why, and then resolving that either through process uh, changes or through equipment changes. Yeah, yeah. And I got to admit, I mean, we should probably like orient people more because um, there's a lot probably that people listen to, including myself, that don't know a lot about cannabis extracts and what they are and why you would want them and exactly so i'm familiar with regular weed that you smoke yep. you know <laughs> um but beyond that you know i've never been into like dabbing but I, I couldn't even tell you a lot about it could you maybe help like orient newbies to the industry and and I, I say this, and the, part of the reason why I want to add this conversation, because biotech sort of touches every industry. Mm -hmm. And ev the Everyman Bio podcast is really about shining a light on self-taught DIY bio people like yourself. Whether or not you see yourself that way, you sort of are because you're using biology. You're growing this amazing plant that has a lot of demand and medicinal value. And you're using these self-taught skills that you've learned along the way. And you're using chemistry and you're tying that all together into a really like burgeoning market that's probably only going to continue to grow in the next decade. Uh, so like extracts, mm -hmm. what's the one-on-one -on -one high level? What are they? Why are growers like into extracts? How are they used? Sure. So um, we'll start with the basics. Uh, the cannabis plant or marijuana, um, same, same thing, different names. Uh, it's a resinous plant. And so what that means is that like literal resin, sticky stuff, uh, develops on the outside of the cannabis plant. And that part is really interesting and really important because there are a lot of things that we can extract from plants. Um, and where that thing is in the plant matters a lot uh, when it comes to our extraction. With cannabis, almost everything we want is on the outside. And it grows in these trichomes, uh, which are just kind of like a waxy little container full of that resin. And that resin is gonna contain your cannabinoids which are the, uh, the things that have medical benefits for your body, as well as the, um, you know, the starting components to what's gonna get you high later and have that psychoactive effect. Um, inside those trichomes, you also have some other fatty acids, some other um, compounds. You also have the plant uh, basically sweating terpenes, the way that flowers emit smells. Um, you're also gonna see things like flavonoids and esters that are gonna contribute to flavor in that resin. Um, and so it's a really complicated resin and the word resin um, and specifically resin from cannabis or hash uh, is kind of all just this like lump term for the sticky goo that we get off of this plant. Um, but ultimately that's the goods. Everything else on the plant, all the leaf, the bud itself is, is nothing. That's carbon raw plant material that um, is just the carrier for you to get that sticky stuff into your body. So when you're smoking cannabis, you are burning leaves and vaporizing resin at the same time oh, is I the see. idea. I see. Um, and so that's where uh, it gets really complicated is that, you know, each of these plants can produce different amounts of resin. The resin can have different primary ingredients in it, depending on what you feed it or what was happening to that plant at the time that you harvested it. A plant that's like currently under attack from mites is going to emit different terpenes than one that is like chilling, isolated in a sterile environment. So, um, so the resin itself 
could be hundreds of active compounds. And that's why extraction is so important, is that we don't know what all of those are. We know what some of them are. And we don't know what those some of them all do. And we certainly don't know what they all do together with each other in different combinations. And so extraction allows us first to break that apart into large categories of compounds, as well as just breaking it all the way down into individually, what is this molecule versus that one. And that's a very long process that we have barely touched the surface of. There's 400 terpenes that we've identified that cannabis can produce. Your weed doesn't have 400 terpenes, <laughs> but which ones does it have? Is, takes us some time to get into and break apart. And so extraction helps speed up that identification process by first of all, just isolating these compounds so that it's easier to test for them. It's much easier to look at a map of two places than 20. So we wanna, um, we wanna break it down just for that analytical value. And then from there, um, what we can also do in that process is remove things we don't want remove things that are known to be harmful or known to be toxic or that don't contribute in a meaningful way to your experience. So in the same way that like the leaves are not helping you get high, they're just stuff you're catching on fire and inhaling the smoke and tar from, um, there's lots of stuff in that resin that we don't need either. Um, and that all depends on, you know, how you consume it. That's where the bio part of our tech gets real complicated because we have to deal with the biology of the plant and then mix that up with the biology of individual humans. And so the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Um, that's a math equation we'll never get to the end of, uh, <laughs> but it's a really fun one because there is so much to break apart. And so when, um, when we're studying it and identifying these compounds, that level of extraction, very high end, a lot of precision involved in that. Um, the other half of extraction is all about delivering you that resin in a consistency that you can consume. And so that part of extraction gets very loose because I can just touch weed, get that sticky stuff on my fingers, ball it up, and now I have hash. Because it's just oh. the resin that we started with. And I haven't done any- So hash is just, hash is just the, the just resin. Just the resin on the outside of the plant, yeah. Is there um, any truth to, I'm so glad I get to speak to a cannabis expert here. <laughs> when you go into a dispensary and they show you the product, is there really any way of gauging the quality or how good of a, a product it is just by looking at its physical characteristics? Well, you have to start by defining quality, right? So, you know, in that regard, um, like this is where chemistry is easier because chemistry yeah. would be like, what did you want, THC? Well, then whichever one has the most THC wins, right? But it's not that simple because a lot of THC plus CBD is not the same effect as a lot of THC by itself or a lot of CBD by itself. And so you have all those different um, you know, qualities to consider and the way they work together. And all of those make up your personal definition of good. Um, and then you have all the other compounds to consider. So terpenes are your aroma. So they'll make it smell a certain way. So is that why they, they, they have you smell it? And, and, yeah. and, and that's more like, I guess, a personal preference? Totally, absolutely. Okay. The, um, the inhalation of certain terpenes certainly has studied value. Um, it can, you know, influence your body in important ways. And some of the terpenes like myrcene, we know um, interact with THC and, uh, you know, have, have relevant impact in your body when you consume them. Um, but that's only valid if you're smoking it, right? Not if it's in food, because your stomach acid will destroy terpenes. So there's, mm. that, that's a, that's a marketing gimmick. Um, <laughs> your stomach can't smell, so that one doesn't help. Um, but the terpenes, again, are just aroma. And so um, if you care about like medical value and effect, the things like the terpenes and the cannabinoids are obvious uh, priorities. But the actual flavor that you taste in your mouth, that comes from like esters and flavonoids. Um, terpenes taste disgusting, they're bitter, they're awful. Um, you don't taste the terpenes. If you do, you wouldn't want to smoke weed. So you've got things like flavonoids that are really important. Canaflavin is a generic one. Um, and uh, that one gives you um, some also noted uh, effects that have you know demonstrated some value in your consumption. Some of these um, flavonoids and esters 
also are important for when you eat cannabis because of the way that they can protect other compounds in your stomach acid. Oh, interesting. Um, and so, you know, it's like you have all these different applications. You have all these different priorities. So the type of concentrate I would want if I'm going to go home and dab it versus the kind of concentrate I want if I'm going to go home and put it in food. Um, and even then, the type of concentrate I want if I smoke only a little bit late at night versus something that I want to smoke all day long. Like, these are all different products, you know? Um, it's kind of like saying, well, which pain reliever is best? Mm, 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 mm. Like, yeah. what kind of pain do you have? What kind of pain do you want? You know, there's a lot of questions. And so it's a purple one. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is the, I'm curious to know, like, what is the underlying chemical difference between, like, a cannabis and sativa? You know, because they're, they're marketed yeah. as having different, and even hybrids, they're marketed as having different effects. Right. But is that just a variation on THC and CBD, or is it more compli- complex yeah. than that? So, Sativa and indica are classifications of phenotypes of plants. So we got to start there, which is that um, you can't have a sativa or edible because it's not a plant. Um, And so sativa and indica can only describe a plant. And um, and so it's it's a physical characteristic of that plant. So a sativa grows very tall, has long skinny leaves, um, you know, generally flowers for longer, and that's because those sativas came from areas in the world where those features are important to survival. You know, if there's a lot of other dense veg- vegetation, I need to grow taller. If there's a lot of pests, I need to have narrower leaves, less food for my enemies, right? Um, whereas an indica would come from a totally opposite landscape where they have a shorter growing season, so they can't spend all of their time growing tall. And they have less sunlight, so they have to have wider leaves to absorb that to gain enough energy to move on to the next phase of their life, which is produce seeds, reproduce, and die. Um, so, you know, these plants, uh, as far as sativas and indicas go, these are physical attributes to help them in their environment, you know. So that's like short people versus tall people, you know, like redheads and, you know, blondes. Like, it's a physical description. Now, if we're talking about a plant that is a sativa and is growing in that like rainforest environment right now, that life experience of that plant is um, going to influence the type of chemicals it is going to produce in its lifespan. So like I mentioned earlier, if it's being attacked by bugs, it's producing the types of terpenes that are designed to deter those bugs. If I'm this kush plant growing up in the top of the mountains and there's not a bumblebee for two miles, let alone aphids or anything that I have to worry about, then I'm going to smell as good as I possibly can to attract that one bumblebee and I don't have to worry about the pests, right? So those plants have a predisposition to produce slightly different chemicals based on their lived experience. And if I take those two plants and I put them both in a sterile room, and grow them next to each other, I can almost make them mimic each other in that chemical output because I'm going to feed them the same things. They're going to have the same lived experience as far as temperature, humidity, wind, um, nutrients, uh, you know, lack of pests, things like that. And so there is that genetic predisposition where some strains are just going to produce more CBD or going to produce more TACV, um, you know, or going to smell like lemons, you know, like there's some genetic aspects to that, you know, in the same way that, like, not all tall people have heart disease, but some of them might, you know, and it's not because they're tall, but, like, maybe a lot of tall people have heart disease, you know, it's really hard to say, uh, you know, what is the cause versus what is just, like, two similar facts. So when they say, like, indica has a more sedative type experience with it, it, how much of that is true? None, because in the wow. time, the leaves were fat, and the leaves don't have the resin that you're smoking. It's un, it's a wow. Resin. So you could um, get a sativa, and that could have a that could have exactly the same exactly. set as quote unquote set. I, I can have a sativa or an indica that produces a lot of CBD, and so what might be sedative is having two percent CBD in there. You know what might be sedative is having more myrcene as the dominant terpene versus like limonene, which is a stimulant, you know? Um, and so like the, you know, and a lot of people want, we want to classify everything, you know, we want to be able yeah. to say there's hard rules, 
and this is what's going to happen. But you know, if, if you look at something like alcohol, for example, right? So ethanol is ethanol in all of the different alcohols. Ultimately, that's the same thing getting you drunk. Yeah. Um, and I could put the same amount of ethanol in two different alcohols, um, but whiskey and tequila don't feel the same. Mm. And depending on who you are, whiskey might be for you, and tequila might not. We're opposite. And now we can say, well, the whiskey has a lot of gluten, um, or the you know tequila has a lot of sugar. You know, we can start saying this is why. It's this one other thing. That's such it's a good never point. that simple. It's never that simple. You know, and sometimes it's not the whiskey or the tequila. It's the you. Sometimes yeah. you're the one who just shouldn't have margaritas. You know, so like it's hard to it's hard to classify your experience with a plant. Like you're both so complicated that it's really hard to predict that. And so you can say, I've tried lemon kush and it made me very tired. And now when you buy more lemon kush, it'll probably still make you tired. That doesn't mean I will have that experience. It doesn't mean your friend will have that experience because your friends might like tequila and you might not, you know, like it's just, it's, there's too many variables to break it down, but the indica and sativa part kind of comes from that, uh, you know, that history of cannabis where all of the information we've ever gotten is from the growers. Mm. So, you know, who cares a lot about indica and sativa is a grower who has eight foot ceilings versus 14 foot ceilings. I don't have time for your sativas. If my ceilings don't go up to 14 feet, I won't have room for those sativas, you know? Um, and, you know, similarly, uh, if I have an overly humid environment and I can't maintain that humidity well, I don't want to be growing those indicates because they're too dense and they're going to molt, you know? So, like, you end up making really important choices in the garden based on phenotype because it's about the plants. Um, it's not about the chemotype. And the chemotype is what category of chemicals it's producing. And so chemotype, if we had fun words like sativa and indica for it, would give you more information. But chemotype is a very, very, very long list. So I would have to have every letter in the alphabet represented to give you, you know, a, an even kind of spread. And so, you know, like, that a, a, stop like a nutritional <laughs> facts for, for <laughs> weed. Exactly. <laughs> and, right. And the nutritional facts uh, guide would still only tell you, like, here's the compounds in it. And then you would have to go and find out what are they. What do they do? How does that affect you? Yeah. Um, you know, and that information is as deep and dark as Google itself. So there's a lot to get into. <laughs> so when you go to a dispensary, because I'm in California and I've been to a dispensary and it shows you THC levels or as a mm -hmm. percentage and CBD right. levels, how does that work? Are they sending the, is the grower sending it off to a lab that's sort of doing the testing, probably doing very similar work as what you're doing, which is actually extracting that out and measuring it yeah. and then certifying it and sending it back. Um, it sounds like though, and I'll let you answer that question, but it sounds like those two numbers are really just a small piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. of the effects that it, that it could potentially have. Yeah, so in most uh, states, especially anywhere where you see recreational cannabis, they are going to have third party testing requirements. So you can always test it yourself, um, but that's not what goes on the package. Uh, what goes on the package has to be certified by a third party lab, and usually those labs are held to ISO standards and are, you know, similar to like a urine analysis lab or any other type of lab where you're just bringing in samples and testing for a specific panel of active ingredients and um and depending on what you're testing for there's different methods used for that potency for thc cbd etc that's usually going to be an hplc test um and uh you know there is some that are going to use gas chromatography instead um but generally that's not preferred for this application because of the decarboxylation that can occur um you can do the math backwards but who wants to do math you know um so <laughs> Uh, so HPLC is kind of the standard for that, uh, but then you also have these labs testing for like terpenes and residual solvents, and a lot of that is going to be your gas chromatography to quantify those. Um, you're going to have pesticide testing, um, which is going to be, you know, uh, a column and mass spec, um, you know, and you're going to have heavy metal testing, which is, you know, as a digestion, there's a whole bunch of different methods 
Um, but this individual sample that represents however many pounds of actual oil or weed, um, actually, you know, represents that, that number gets very, um, you know, spread out. And it's almost always just based on what is required. There's very little voluntary extras going on. And, um, and so all of that's, you know, required uh, to be certified by a third party that goes on the label. And then that goes to you. Uh, and so now you're getting, you know, that let's say, you know, let's say your weed says that it's 20% THC, right? Um, so it's 80% not. And uh, if they detect no heavy metals and no pesticide and no mold, you know, or, you know, like they've gone through all that other list, then we're still at 80% what? Uh, and there's no effort to close the gap, right? Like a, a, a mass balance of everything that's in there is not accounted for. And that's, I think, the strangest thing about cannabis is that it is very common for someone to buy a concentrate, an extract, and it'll be 70% cannabinoid. And 30%, I don't know, you know, 30% of no one has checked. And so that's the part that I think is the most important for consumers to care about, because what we know is great. That's information we can use and work with. What we don't know is the biggest variance. And so that's where the same amount of ethanol in whiskey versus tequila isn't the right amount of information. What else is in there? You know, if that's 70% uh, percent by weight, then what's the other 30? Uh, because that's what's going to give you different experiences. Because the THC is the same. You know, the CBD is the same. No matter where I get it from, no matter what strain I get it from, no matter what plant or field, whatever, at its isolated molecule, they're identical. Um, so it's the other stuff that really is important to us. And if a grower is getting sending off a small sample and getting it tested, how much of that varies between plants of the same? All of it. There's so no, it's not even that yeah, particularly like it's not accurate. Like say it. say your your go to is Pineapple Express. I'm just gonna th name mm -hmm. one. You could you could have wildly different profile chemical profiles. Yeah, not only absolutely. between geographic areas, but growers and, and even within the same grower, individual plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and even on the plant itself. So the buds at the top that are closest to the light are going to have a different chemical uh, you know, profile than the ones at the bottom that are in the shade. And there's you often know, a and very large price difference between some of the more, I don't know, higher quality or that's at least how they're marketed. Right. But you could maybe get a cheaper weed, but still have an amazing experience with it. Exactly. And that's why I answered your other question with like, how do you define quality? Because, you know, if you're going into it for THC content and avoiding lemon flavors, because, you know, you haven't had good experiences with those, but you want to get high, you know, like you can set your own rules as a shopper. Um, then, you know, these exotic strains, what makes them more expensive is not the amount of THC or whether or not it smells like lemon. It's um, the exclusivity of the genetic, right? Um, and so it would be uh, the fact that it's a new genetic or that it's in a rap song or <laughs> that it's grown by a grower with incredible branding and really nice jars. Um, it is marketed to you in the same way that you know, you have 14 different options of mid-shelf vodka that are the same. And like half of them will come from the same distillery and it's just a different bottle. And the one with the wax on the lid is $4 more and you're a sucker, so you fall for that. Same thing with cannabis. That's the marketing part, uh, you know, which is that if you will pay more for it, that will be fine. We will, we will take more money for it. That will be okay. We'll, uh, we'll give you whatever excuse. So the chemical content is not really a factor in that purchase. A lot of it is how can I market it? Mm. Because a bread that is extremely resinous and has a really high ratio of relevant chemical compounds would be loose and kind of leafy. It would be ugly. An ounce would take up the whole freezer bag. Um, it would not you know, it would not have the appeal of like this beautiful purplish with pink hairs, frosty buds, like these cool 
you know, interesting plant features are totally aesthetic. And since you're buying it based on appearance, we, we push the aesthetic, you know? But like the cheeseburger on the menu is not the cheeseburger in your bag always. Um, mm. So you've got to keep that in mind. And then you've just really got to think about what, what matters to you as a consumer. You know, if I'm making, you know, cheap, cheap margaritas for a party, I'm going to get the cheaper tequila because it's fun. You know, if I want to celebrate a fancy night out, I might buy a higher end, you know, like there's, there's all these different reasons why I might make this one purchase or another. It's very rarely the chemical purity. Sometimes just to feel like, how, how do you feel about it? Right. Hey, a placebo exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. What, what some of the buds they're marketed as smelling a particular way. You use lemon as your example, but I've, mm -hmm. I've heard and re seen other ones. And I, some of them are so strong in one particular smell, like strawberry, or they go beyond lemon. And mm -hmm. it, it always crossed my mind that it doesn't seem real. Because yeah. <laughs> they almost don't smell like regular weed. Right. Are, is it real? <laughs> are there any growers that are actually like putting some sort of you know, smell enhancer on top, like so some kind of oil. It's not like it's not like spraying on a perfume where the smell is coming from somewhere else. But um, we can control plants quite a bit. And so, if you think of it this way, like if you eat asparagus, your body makes certain smells, right? Like certain diets make certain people's body odor smell a certain way. We can influence a plant based on how we feed it. And um, we can also influence that plant based on its lived experience. So, you know, it starts with making sure it doesn't produce the stinky terpenes that are designed to deter pests, right? Because they're going to smell bad. I don't need those anywhere near my, my product. It's going to, you know, it only takes a little bit of bad to ruin the rest of the good. Um, and then there's certain terpenes that are just in cannabis no matter what based on the type of plant that it is. So mercy is a good example of that. Mercy is in hops um, as well as cannabis. They're in the same family. And cannabis produces a lot of myrcene. And that's a pretty strong smell. It's not necessarily one that people gravitate towards. Like some people love that, you know, hops kind of smell. Um, but, you know, that's usually the one that like your mom is complaining about when you smell like weed, right? Is that like kind of lingering musky sort of um, smell. Um, then we have a whole bunch of others that are just kind of from the genetic regions that these plants originally came from. So you're going to see, uh, you know, the strong citrus from areas where there was a lot of pests because these strong citrus are natural insecticides. So those plants just kind of have the genes to uh, produce that certain smell, uh, um, you know, and, you know, just like that other plant with no bumblebees around, it's going to go out of its way to smell incredible. And so it's also going to produce those smells based on the competing vegetation. And so if there's a lot of stuff that smells like citrus, I'm going to smell like strawberries, you know, mm. um, because that's going to get the bumblebees over here where I want them, you know. And so um, so some of it is genetic predisposition and some of it is just kind of feeding and stressing the plant out. One thing that's really interesting about cannabis is that a lot of those smells and the complexity of that flavor is the result of us growing it. Um, if that plant was growing in the wild, it would have smelled good for a week, gotten pollinated, and then it would have gone into a mother mode and started protecting those seeds from pests and environment again. And so, you know, a green, fresh, young cannabis plant does not smell like gingerbread or, you know, <laughs> or strawberry uh, or blueberry or muffins or whatever. You know, it, it smells like a green plant because that is the smell that keeps gnats away and, and aphids off your leaves. And so if if cannabis was allowed to go back into seed production, we would see a lot more of those flavors. But because we prevent it from ever producing seeds, we kill it at the peak of it trying to be as attractive as it possibly can. All of that incredible smell is to attract pollinators that we are prohibiting from getting there. So that creates a ton of stress on that plant, which makes it open up new ways, you know, to try and attract those pollinators. So like, it's a very human impact, you know, like we do that to cannabis. Cannabis doesn't do that for us. It does that to fight us and we're just tricking it um, mm -hmm. because we like it. That's so um, that's where a lot of breeders will select plants that happen to have those notes. 
crossbreed them back with other plants that are, um, you know, have physical attributes that they want or similar flavors that they want or, you know, other, you know, resin features that they're looking for. And we've created, you know, like all cannabis is, is genetically modified through selective breeding in that sense that we've decided what we want cannabis to look and smell and taste like. So it's as real uh, as the plant producing it, but it is not through natural evolution. That's, that's the result of us growing indoors. Yeah, really cool. So I think most people, when they think about like, what are the active ingredients? We talked a little bit about this THC and CBD. Those are sort of the main ones, mm -hmm. but with extraction, you're basically, I guess it sounds like the first step is you're taking away the plant matter yep. from the resin. Mm -hmm. Are you then extracting out the resin into like separation of that? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that. Are you separating that like terpenes, which I think you said control the smell mm -hmm. of it, right? Yep. And then, and then there's the actual uh, cannabinoids, which are like, that has the psychoactive components as well as like, I think there's hundreds of cannabinoids as well. Yeah. But, and you said that, I think you said when you do the extraction, 70% of it is known, but then there's always this remaining 30%. I mean, yeah, it, that's where the type of extraction um, starts to become really relevant because, you know, if we use my first example of like the weed is sticky, I touch it, now the sticky is on me, I've got an extract here. Um, that's going to have a little bit of plant material still remaining. It's going to have all of the like, you know, fats and waxes that were containing that resin. Um, it's also going to have degradation products because as soon as I've burst that little trichome, now everything in there is exposed to oxygen. And, and so, what's a trichome? Just so um, trichomes are those little noodly guys that you see uh, pictures of. They're sticking off of the end of the leaf. Okay, and so there's, there's the leaf, and then there's the mm -hmm. crystals on the leaf, which is yeah, like so the resin. Yeah, so like crystals, but that's it's actually gooey resin. Yeah. Okay, so that's a resin, and then there's yeah. also these little. What are what do you I don't know what you call them. You had a, like not stems, but these little orange, these fuzzy little hairs, yeah. little hairs mm -hmm. that stick out. Yeah. And and what's is there a difference in what the little hairs have versus the resin? Yeah, for sure. So the resin is is where your cannabinoids are. All of the hairs and all of that kind of structure is um, you know these are these are differences for the plant that um, you know have a lot to do with like attracting pollen and trapping pollen versus, um, you know, making the buds inaccessible. Um, it also, uh, you know, has a lot to do with like the, the growing environment. And so, you know, you're going to see plants with really wide leaves and not a lot of small sugar leaf. Um, and then you're going to see the exact opposite where they have a lot of little sugar leaves. And so it's just, you know, it's kind of, um, you know, it's just the diversities in the plant, you know, like all of these different roses have kind of different features, but they all kind of smell like roses too. Um, so, you know, the, the resin itself within that trichome, that's the most relevant. Um, there is going to be some uh, other content throughout the, the plant material that's valuable for reasons. Um, things like, you know, like certain compounds within that leaf material that may very well help protect cannabinoids in your stomach when you okay. consume it, for example. Um, but they don't really play into anything that I'm going to smoke. And so when it comes down to like vaporizing or smoking it, I want as few ingredients in there as possible. And, uh, you know, because anything extra is just something I'm catching on fire, right? Anything extra could be potentially leading to more degre degradation and um, you know, it's going to contribute to flavors that start out smelling good and end smelling old. So in that way, you know, the different types of extraction are going to either target compounds that they want or directly target removing compounds that we don't. And so depending on the quality of the material that we're extracting and depending on the product that we want to make at the end of it, we might focus on a method of extraction where I'm going straight to isolate. I want 99%. I want just the CBD. Um, or I might be looking for a product that has as much of that flavor as I can preserve. And preserving some of that flavor does call for preserving some of those other compounds because terpenes are unstable by themselves. And, you know, esters and things like that can, can denature and get old. So we we want to not just expose them and leave them all by themselves, you know, and like think of uh, mushroom extraction for that reason. Like some of these compounds you get for a minute and then, you know, it, you, you can destroy it easier than you can make it. And so some of our extraction processes are preservation oriented. Some of them are about removing contaminants. 
And a lot of them are about trying to compromise those two goals uh, for the least amount of money. <laughs> so what are some of the main products that come out of the extraction process and what are the different, uh, different extraction techniques that are used to create those main products? So, I mean, I think the first category is um, concentrates that you're going to dab or smoke. And those tend to be the 70 to 80 to 90 percent purity range. They're rarely up in the 99s. Um, of just because, cannabinoids. Of, yeah, just cannabinoids. Okay. And that's, um, that's in part because we want a lot of that flavor to stay in there. And because a lot of that extra uh, content can help influence the texture and the appearance. Um, so, you know, if I have THCA and it's 99% pure, that's a white powder and you can touch it. If I have THC and it's 99% pure, that is a sticky, gooey liquid. And you can't get it into or out of a jar without heating it up. So depending on how you want to smoke that, if you want to sprinkle it on your joint, you don't want 99% THC. That's going to be a nightmare, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if I can... Joey Diaz level, I don't know if you know who that is, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> these things, it's, you know, it's, so it's part aesthetic and part kind of function in that way, where, um, you know, having Delta 9 that's, you know, only part of it and having a whole bunch of THCA instead and not allowing it to decarb can give me a product that's more tangible. Or it'll give me a product that looks like a diamond and so you'll pay more for it, you know? Um, oh, wow. So, okay. You know, we have, you know, we have these different physical structures because the acidic form um, of THC, that THCA, uh, is, a, is a crystalline solid. Whereas delta nine is a you know very sticky liquid, and that's just their natural states. And What's so, the wax? So the that's wax the only thing I've seen. Like, uh, so the wax term in general. So uh, that's one of those situations where um, the name is just to describe what it looks like. So think of shatter. Shatter is not like a noun; that's a verb, right? But we call shatter shatter because you could break it and it would shatter like glass. Um, so when people call that um, that smoking concentrate wax, it's not because of actual wax content necessarily. It's because it looks like wax, and so um, and it has more THCA. Uh, it'll have more THCA than um, than anything else to have that solid structure. But so does shatter. So shatter and wax are basically the same product. Um, the difference between shatter and wax is that with shatter, I have taken my oil when it still has solvent in it, um, not very much, just a little bit, and I pour it really thin. And so when it, when all of that solvent is evaporated, I'm going to have this um, translucent solid because it's that THCA, which is still crystallizing essentially to form that structure, um, but it's doing so in a pretty homogenous way because it isn't pure. And... Uh, and so then with wax, I have the same oil, but I whip it up. And so I introduce all this air into it. Uh. So it's not that it's actually different than the shatter. It's clear like the shatter if I melt it down. prepared differently. You're looking at tiny air bubbles that are reflecting light. That's what makes it opaque to you. Like that's, a, that's an illusion, right? That's just aesthetic. So that's like scrambled eggs. <laughs> You know, versus like just frying your eggs. Mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they're the same thing. It's just how I prepared it to hand to you. And so um, the same product that can make wax and shatter, I can just crystallize it with a little bit more solvent in the solution and grow diamonds. And then I could take that pure THCA right out of there. And all the liquid that's in there would represent the other part that's making up, you know, the wax and the shatter. So the wax and the shatter are homogenous, whereas the crystallized stuff, the sauce, is those homogenous compounds, but broken up into little pieces before you combine them again anyway to smoke it. So, you know, it's very much about like how I'm giving it to you. It's like, do you want, you know, affogato, you want the espresso, you know, on top instead of on the bottom or whatever <laughs> you're asking for. Um, you know, a lot of that is presentation, aesthetic, and, you know, a little bit just the function of how you want to smoke it. Um, and then, you know, besides that uh, presentation, which we can affect literally manually, just by how I pour it out, how I heat it up, how I handle it, you also have the differences with different solvent choices. And so, you know, this is where chemistry should play a really important role. Doesn't always. Um, but Wait, you know, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? It sounds, <laughs> nothing, it sounds just like nothing but chemistry. Well, it, it 
is and it isn't. So if I, again, if I were looking at a 99% pure product, what I would do is I would choose the best solvent for extracting that compound. Or I would choose a solvent that's very good for that compound, but also simultaneously very bad at extracting the things I don't want. I see. And there's a lot of methods of extraction in food and cannabis that are catch-alls. And so like ethanol, for example, as an extraction solvent gives me a little bit of the water solubles, a little bit of the non-polars, which means I have a really complicated problem in that bucket when I'm done getting all of that solution out. And so, you know, if I start with something, you know, like hexane, which is going to extract a very specific list of things, then I have an easier job cleaning that up and purifying it. But I don't have a very specific list of things I want out of that cannabis because I don't know what's in it before I run it most of the time, except for like the assumption that there's THC in there or quantification of the THC in there, which still is only going to tell me how much THC I can get out, you know, so it's, it's still not enough information. Um, so, you know, we have the opportunity to use really selective solvents or less selective solvents. Um, but what we generally do is just use the solvent that gives us a little bit of both based on what we think is going to be there. And then we, and then we deal with whatever comes out. You know, um, there's a lot of people using CO2 in the cannabis industry and CO2 is capable of any, any type of, you know, solubility almost if you control it. Um, but what people do is not control it at all. And they just say anything that comes out at 2000 PSI is what I will have. Thank you very much. And we don't target our extraction. Um, and part of it's because you, the consumer doesn't ask us what that other 30% is. So we don't have to answer. Oh, that's interesting. So what is the main motivator for a grower to get into the extraction side? Is it to capture more of the market? Because there's obviously a, a demand for these products. Um, there's also you know, obviously a demand for extraction based products. Is that the main driver? Um, so there's definitely, uh, you know, value in those products, but you also can take advantage of the extraction. I can hear you. We hear you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Answer some of these questions for your mom. <laughs> Go to outer space. That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of um, extraction started by trying to get something useful out of the trim, the parts of the bed that you don't buy. And so the trim is covered in resin. Anyone who's had to trim before is going to be familiar with that. And so there's a lot of resin that is lost. Um, through that trimming process that can be recaptured. And so the first reason would be to not throw that away or pay someone else to monetize it. Um, you can take your own garbage and turn Great it into reason. money. Yeah. Um, extraction is also a get out of jail free card if something goes wrong in a grow. And um, I've, I've run grows before. I don't do that now. Growing is hard. And the consequences of things going wrong in the grow take time and you still have to finish investing money in it, you know? Um, like I I can stop an extraction part way through and say, this isn't gonna work and start over again. Uh, there are no do-overs in the grow, you know? Like you grow that plant, whatever happens, happens. You grow that plant perfectly for three and a half months and then, you know, have a, a power outage or an employee quit and <laughs> suddenly it's ruined, you know? So the, um, the very uncertain nature of trying to, you know, grow an agricultural product like cannabis that is so heavily regulated the way that it is, um, it, it gives you very little margin for losses. And so extraction helps you recover from those losses because even if I do have a pest issue, I can extract that product, get the useful part out, and leave the pest part behind. Um, so, you know, that it's kind of like insurance against your crop if you can always extract it anyway. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, the, the bigger your crop, the more risk you take, mm -hmm. you know, the more potential profit, but like all things, the more risk you take. And especially with growing something like, like mushrooms or, or like uh, marijuana, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. Yeah. It's like a, a big time investment and uh, everything has to sort of go right till the very end. For you to reap those rewards so that's that's interesting 
So what is like, if someone wants to get into extraction, are people doing this on an individual level or is it mainly just businesses that are doing it? Um, it's, it's both, absolutely. So certain methods of extraction aren't appropriate to try at home because they um, are explosive or <laughs> hexane, so, for you example. Know, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues <laughs> with certain methods of extraction that don't make it appropriate for home. Um, but then there's a lot of methods that are very easy to do at home. You know, a simple ethanol extraction is relatively easy to do at home. Equipment to recover that ethanol safely is similar to what you would do if you were home brewing or home distilling. Um, so, you know, there's that level of chemical extraction that's absolutely happening at a home level. And then there's a lot of um, very simple hash making, which is where we're using like dry ice or literally water and ice. And instead of dissolving any of that resin, we're just separating it from the plant material. So we're not getting that really, really high purity, but we are getting rid of most of the plant that is unnecessary. And, um, and that being, you know, water and ice, it's a little bit cold and maybe slippery, but very accessible for anyone to try at home. It is also just manual labor, which is yeah. more effort than on the commercial side, are they, are they like, what's the investment? Is it tens of thousands? Is it hundreds of thousands for, I would imagine some of the really large growers, it's, it's probably quite a bit. I've seen some yeah. of the equipment, you know, I don't know. Does it, you have to have a clean room when you do these things? It's so, mm, yes and no. Um, so because of the nature of the regulatory environment for cannabis, it's state by state. And it's often municipality by municipality. Uh, so okay. the county land might have one set of rules and the town within that county might have a different set of rules. Um, it gets very nuanced um, as far as what's uh, required in one place or another. That's where analytical labs being ISO standardized, like that's, you can look up the standard. And you could say, okay, this is what that requires. So no carpet over here, guys, and just you know keep um, keep things really consistent. But within cannabis labs, what you'll hear is a lot of weird abbreviations and names and classifications of these labs. They're totally made up. They're totally fabricated for cannabis. And so, like a Type Seven license in California versus a Type Six license is just whether or not you use flammable solvents. But whether or not you have carpet in that lab you know, is like not you know necessarily outlined. Um, so a lot of these rules just come down to who wrote them. Um, ideally, you would want uh, you know certain safety protocols no matter what. And there's a lot of national codes that you know are either written into the laws or that we as an industry elect to impose upon ourselves. And uh, there's also, um, you know, a lot of like manufacturing processes that we try to mimic. But, you know, it's, it's pretty common for someone in cannabis to say, we have a GMP facility, but they don't because they have floor drains and they have, you know, like open, you know, exposed rafters and things like that. But what they mean is like, I record every single batch of solvent that I get in and I store the COA for it. And I can tell you which solvents that, uh, you know, which products use solvent from that batch. And so we'll have a piece of GMP, but not all of it. Or I might have, you know, a clean air exchange before I enter one part of my building, but not another. So it's, uh, it's never consistent anywhere from one lab to another. It's definitely a lot of buzzwords, I think, when it comes down to that. Um, but a lot of us are operating as though national um, safety and, you know, sanitation codes will be imposed because if the federal government legalizes it and the licensing goes out of the hands of the state, then it will be FDA, OSHA, GMP, it will be very standard, you know, consistent rules everywhere and then it'll get to the point where like a dairy is the same almost anywhere mm. that you go um but right now it's crazy every single lab <laughs> is completely different oh, nice. some labs will require a hairnet um some labs you can like eat a cheeseburger while you're standing there like people there's a huge difference <laughs> no matter where you go now, you mentioned genetic engineering earlier, and that's an interest in mine and something I'm learning and studying right now. And, you know, genetic engineering for a lot of agricultural products really is mainly selective breeding. It's something mm -hmm. we've been doing for 
thousands of years and it works really well. But in can the cannabis industry, there's definitely been some, some cutting edge research going on in things like engineering yeast to produce cannabinoids and fermenting oh. lots of yeast to produce yeast. Do you follow any of that at all? Do, what do you think about some of those? I, I do. And it's all fascinating, especially for the analytical applications. Because if I want to study a novel cannabinoid like THCV, right? So there's like two or three genetics that produce whole numbers of percentage points of THCV at all, right? And then to go in and extract those and isolate that THCV down would be costly. And so then that makes researching what is this THCV and what does it do really difficult because we also don't have standard academic grants and so this is all private funding. and. Um, I can't tell you if you can monetize this information about this novel cannabinoid until I look at it and learn some things. So um, being able to just make it is clearly the superior answer for that type of analytical environment because I have so much cost that is just sunk on isolating that from elsewhere. Mm. Um, that's also where you see a lot of these um, cannabinoids get a little bit of hype and fame. That's why you heard a lot about CBD this last year is because CBD was hot before that. And, um, you know, and so now if I want to make more money, I want to promote a different cannabinoid. And so the fact that there was less CBD available made it more valuable. Um, you know, and so we're going to keep seeing that with the discovery of new cannabinoids. And, and so being able to just grow them to be able to study them is huge. Um, but it doesn't compete with just growing in the field yet. And it only produces that cannabinoid. Mm. And so the, the medical market has insisted on, you know, this full spectrum, broad spectrum type of definition for a really long time because the medical market grew out of black market. The medical market grew out of, we don't have a, it's a bag from a guy, it's weed. You know, there wasn't names. Um, you know, the medical market grew from people who were handling it themselves. So, you know, they, they didn't want someone else to grow it and analyze it for them. They said, this is my weed that I grew and that made it the best. And so, um, you know, so the medical market has never really demanded that type of product. They've always demanded the diversity that comes from just growing whatever. And the recreational market has come with a lot of compromises and the recreational market definitely has led to more of that, you know, CBD isolate type of product um, because it's easy and economical to produce. It makes it widely available to everyone, but it's not complex. And so now that marketing problem comes into play of like, how do I sell another CBD tincture? You know, like, do I get a different shaped bottle, a revolutionary dropper? You know, like it starts to not become about the cannabinoid anymore. And so the agricultural product will always have that advantage over growing it in a dish because nature does whatever it wants. We are very predictable. Even if you try to have unique ideas, we kind of come up with the same ideas a lot. Whereas nature will just do crazy things. You know, like you can grow clones and still have a variegated one for no reason out of nowhere. Hmm. And uh, that's nature. So we can't really compete with that. And so far, the consumer has not requested the type of sterile product that, you know, um, massive pharmaceutical production of cannabinoids would really call for. Yeah, I do wonder if in the future we're going to see, you know, because there's been so much hype with CBD in the last several years and all there's all these new products that have come to market. I wonder if in the future we're going to start just seeing that line of products, the cannabinoid products continue to grow and uh, enter into the public sphere. One of the things I wanted to touch on before we close out here was it you mentioned um, you sort of talk about chemistry as it's like it's not it's real chemistry, but there's, there's something like holding it back from its real possibilities. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, I think we're, we're probably in the next five years, I would guess it's going to be federally legalized. Mm -hmm. I think everybody sort of feels that way. And I think it's even going to be voted on in the next week or two, potentially, if it makes it to the floor. Um, how does that impact like the people that are in the industry and also just how it operates in general? One of the things you mentioned was there's all these differences between the standards and the codes and the regulations 
clearly there's got to be some advantages for that to be consolidated and and being uh, standardized across the board. There's also something to be said, I guess, about the flexibility at the local level. Um, right. where, like when this thing gets legalized, how do you think that's going to impact what it is that you do, the extraction part of it, and how, how it's operated and how it's run? It's, um, it's going to be really interesting. It depends on which direction that legalization goes, for starters. Um, the type of rules I'm going to have to deal with if I'm governed by the ATF is very different than who I would deal with if I'm governed by the FDA, for example, right? Like the FDA isn't telling, you know, Jewel what kind of mango to use in their pods. They're coming out later and saying, hey, that mango stuff is full of pesticides, stop. You know, so it's a, it's a different um, type of industrial experience uh, depending on who's in charge. And it could really go a lot of different directions. But I think that in either of those cases, one thing that we'll see um, probably no matter what will be a change to that you know, entrance barrier to the industry. So right now it's very easy to get an entry level job anywhere and just walk in and learn how to extract um, kind of apprentice style, meaning that you're just trained by someone else who knows the thing. Uh, and so there's not really, there's not a degree that's required. There's not, um, you know, any kind of traditional trajectory for that type of education. There's no onboarding. You might fill out your W-4 the first day, maybe not, you know, like there's, uh, there's not consistency in that um, experience for employees. And so on the positive, it means it's very easy for you to walk in with no experience and work your way up. Um, in a company and get to the top, which is, you know, something I'm uh, a huge fan of because it's how I got involved in this industry. Me but too. at the same time, it means that I can walk in, get an entry level job in a scary dungeon of mm. mystery combustibles and very dangerous work environments. And I can be trained by someone with limited experience and they can put me in an unsafe situation. And at the end of it, I won't know any better. And maybe I'll be stuck repeating that process, you know, through multiple companies and being treated poorly, because if I'm used to work somewhere for six months, get a pay raise, that's not how, you know, these mom and pop startups work, you know, um, if I'm used to uh, someone always training me to use a cash register before asking me to ring up a sale, that's not how the lab works. If someone says, can you write all that down and you've never used a roto and you say yes, good luck. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, there's, so there's so much opportunity, which goes part of the And, uh, you know, that, that is going to be a big change with federal legalization is we yeah. will see OSHA, you know, so it will get safer for employees to operate. Um, but that will also mean that, uh, it will become more expensive for business owners to, uh, start their business. It's already means, gotten so expensive on the tax. It's already side. millions of the dollars. The taxes are insane. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. insane. It's, it's already a million dollar build out, but when that turns into like a billion dollar warehouse, yeah. Yeah. that's going to change the type of business owners that you have. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to be able to say, you know, I'm Murphy and I would love to just make live resin because it's my favorite and go and meet people who want to do that and start a business, um, yeah. you know, with everyone pooling their savings. That's what we can do now. That's not going to be the case when we have the type of uh, infrastructure that OSHA and federal regulation will impose it's, on us. Now we're a Pfizer. Now we're a, you know. Yeah, the barrier to entry will be so high that it only lends itself to these big corporations with deep right. pockets. And, yeah. um, and also that kind of eliminates the entrepreneurial aspect, which is kind of a big mm -hmm. way that so many people got started in the cannabis industry. Right. And a uh, big, big believer in small business and just supporting entrepreneurs. Um, and, and, and piggybacking onto that question, we are seeing a wave of ex cultural acceptance and, and legalization that appears to be happening much quicker uh, than medical marijuana in psychedelics, in the psychedelic space. Mm -hmm. Have you, are any of your growers looking at this space and thinking about like, hey, this might be a new market. We need to start thinking about this right now. Yeah, so I think that that, um, that wave of popularity is directly a result of the corporate shift in cannabis because as many of the entrepreneurial growers who were making money in cannabis are getting pushed out 
of the legal um, framework, especially in places like, say, California and on the West Coast, where that barrier of entry is getting very high and the profits involved are not non-existent. We're seeing these entrepreneurial growers take their skills and apply them elsewhere. And so it's the same people who are fighting for medical and recreational cannabis that are saying, yeah, mushrooms too. Let's have it all, you know? Um, it's the same people who are, um, you know, behind a lot of that. And I think that we're going to continue to see it grow because, you know, I, I, I used to say this started with gay marriage, right? But like states that have gay marriage get medical marijuana first. Um, and so there's just a point where people decide that like what you do is fine. <laughs> Whether I do it or not, you know, it's kind of this like general acceptance of freedom, um, more so than anything about the product. You know, you don't have to be gay or married to support gay marriage. You don't have to use cannabis to support medical marijuana. Um, you don't have to eat mushrooms to be fine with Josh growing mushrooms. You know, like I think that there's this change in um, people just being comfortable with like letting their neighbors live their lives and not criminalizing our behavior. Um, and so, you know, we're going to see a lot more things be more widely accepted. Uh, things like, you know, the, the mushroom development is really exciting because it brings that entrepreneurial um, aspect back into it. But then we look at, you know, like therapy options for MDMA, which is also very exciting. But that goes back to our pharmaceutical world and a little bit different type of environment with you know different barriers for entry. So and there's another company that I know that's also doing mescaline, which is cactus based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's like all this whole class of psychedelics. Many of them come from the various plants that are already around. So if I were a cannabis business owner, I definitely would be looking at psychedelics and be thinking thinking ahead because yeah. probably in well, five if years. You, if you go to extraction equipment sites right now, um, you will see mushroom spore kits sale as well oh interesting like, like the crossover is right there it's the same yeah. people and they are all down there's people turning those um storage containers that were for uh little portable grows and they're just flipping that into a mushroom room because it's obviously the same requirements um yeah. just different settings you know absolutely that's really really interesting Murphy, this was awesome. I've learned a ton about cannabis that I had no idea about. And so it's kind of really, there's like a little kid in me that's just happy I get to talk to someone who's so knowledgeable about the field. Plus, it's so cool to meet another DIY person. I say DIY, you're kind of self-taught. I'm a huge advocate for project-based hands-on learning, which it sounds like you're also an advocate of. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really cool. And it sounds like you've been incredibly successful in this field. So it's, uh, it's, it's very cool to get a chance to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you for yeah. coming on. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having good questions. I love it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if people want to get a hold of you, if someone wants to hire you mm -hmm. to come build out their extraction plan, how do they, how do they get a hold of you? Um, so uh, my private consulting, um, the easiest way to access me is through the, the links on my Instagram, at Murphy Murray, or at Morehash Faster, uh, which is my consulting um, you can also uh, find me at a lot of the different cannabis industry uh, pages um, and then also through the Good Life Gang, which is, uh, you know, kind of a DIY open source community. Um, it's good life, uh, good food, uh, good hash and good people is our, our motto. And um, through the Good Life Gang, our goal is to just promote that entrepreneurial, um, you know, community base for this plant because we are afraid to lose it. And um, the Good Life Gang is just a whole bunch of vetted consultants and vendors for our industry that are committed to um, being, you know, open with our technology and our processes, uh, as well as just supporting each other and being cool people. Very cool. Very cool. So everybody go check that out. Check out her Instagram because it's full of really cool scientific, scientific stuff and uh, really like amazing equipment that I've never seen before. But also all the things that we're talking about, the terpenes and the crystals and you show that stuff. And I, I had no idea that so many different things can be extracted into different formats from cannabis. So it's really, really interesting. Well, Murphy, thank you again, and uh, I really look forward to chatting with you again soon. For sure. Definitely. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye.